and virtual reality. So we're joined by Florian, an expert in data science, and Al, an expert in virtual reality. I'd like them both to introduce themselves briefly, and if you could also please just briefly introduce your, your field. Sure. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here, and the event so far was super, super amazing, and it's amazing what kind of startups Thailand brought up. So, about me as a person, my name is Florian, and my company basically enables data scientists to be more efficient within the problem understanding stage and the data governing stage. As we see here, the biggest problems within the field of data science to become then also into a deployment stage. And what data science basically is, is generating insights from the massive data that is produced by machines, by digital products that we all use all the time. And for that you use statistics or you also use non-probabilistic um, approaches such as, yeah, everybody knows them probably, neural networks as a big buzzword um, from the past years in data science. Right? Oh. I'm Al Padulo, I'm uh, the Global Marketing Director and for production and marketing for uh, 360 Today News. And basically I'm a storyteller. And I've been doing video for about 38 years. And for me, 360 VR and VR 180 is another way of telling a story. What excites me about the, being on this panel is the idea of, especially for 360 Today News, finding out what our viewers want to know about, what is exciting them, what is bringing them in, and translating that information. Right now, I think basically, you know, the way that I look at it is that VR is kind of in an evolutionary state. And I think at this point, we've gone past the crawling point, the crawling stage, and we're now kind of, we're, with VR, we're kind of a toddler. You know, we're not very sure on our feet, we're kind of moving along slowly, and we haven't reached the point where we can integrate data science into the mix yet. But we're trying to figure out how to do that. Earlier on when we were speaking, you were supporting in on this idea of VR being in the toddler space. Mm -hmm. And the way I really like to understand it was you were describing it as, right now we're quite reactive, and the next phase is to be interactive. You know, I think this is exactly where the bridge of data science comes into play. Could you share your thoughts on that? Sure. It, you know, I've been around in, the, in, in VR now for about eight years, and it was very interesting. I'm very lucky to be able to do a lot of interviews with a lot of different people around the world. And I was at a place in a small little office in Santa Monica with a company called Emblematic VR. And they're doing some very interesting things with VR. And the lady who runs it, Noni de la Pena, is kind of known as the godmother of VR. She did one of the first award-winning film festival um, uh, environments where you were experiencing what it was like to be a prisoner in Guantanamo. Okay. And she had one of the first headsets built by this graduate student. And the graduate student's name was Palmer. Mm -hmm. Palmer Lucky. Oculus. who went on to create the Oculus, exactly. which sold for a billion dollars uh, to, uh, to Facebook. So, you know, this was the first step. You know, that was to get it in people's hands, to have a device that puts you in an environment to where you're there. Because what that does, I think, is it opens you up to reacting. Mm -hmm. And right now, it's one-way reaction. People are reacting to it, but we don't understand what their reactions are. And this is where I think that it's going to be vital moving forward for VR to incorporate data science and make use of data science to create more effective presentations. Florian, could you share your thoughts on this kind of movement into becoming interactive and how you think data science plays a pivotal role in that? Yes, definitely. I mean, first of all, the potential of virtual reality is basically that um, we see something with all of our sense, right? And this connection between our eyes to our brain is like super, super fast, like one megabyte per second. So forget about fucking 5G, you have like 6G in your brain. So currently we just use from that like 0.1%. 
that is, for example, when we start to read. So we really condensed and boiled down information so that we can read them in, I don't know, in Germany we have like 24 letters or something. And, um, 26. 20, okay, 26. <laughs> um, you know, and black on white printed. That is how we consume information and yeah. how it works kind of that we can summarize this information. But virtual reality, we um, suddenly can enable the whole potential of getting access to information over this one megabyte direct line to your brain. And here's the problem. So it is, first of all, if it is working, it is perfect. Because we would learn like with a thousand times faster things as we learn it right now by reading. But the problem with that is that um, we need for that understand the person that is actually using virtual reality. And another point why we need to understand what for kind of person is using virtual reality is that right now we're using a mobile phone. It's already part of our body, right? Mm. But technology gets much, much closer to the body. So the next stage will be VR. The next stage will be a contact lens. The next stage will be a chip in your brain. And as closer we come to the body, as much more we need to understand the customer and the consumer who is actually using it and how should be, for example, the content be presented. And there you can use a lot of already established data science processes that you have like in customer segmentation, um, yeah, yeah, or in the advertisement industry right now, but yeah. I think another very good example of how we're moving forward slowly is the, the current iteration of, of headsets. We went from a headset that was connected by a wire, a tether, an mm -hmm. umbilical cord, if you will, mm -hmm. to, a, a, to a computer. So it had something with some processing power to be able to enable the graphics and the video and all the rest of it. Yes. Now we've gone, uh, Oculus came out with the Oculus Go, which was a very consumer friendly, lower priced headset, but yet it was a standalone. It was like a phone without the phone. Yeah. Now the next one, I've got here the Oculus Quest. Now we've taken another step up, and this year they're talking already in September that Oculus is going to be introducing mixed reality and eye tracking. And eye tracking, I think, is your best friend because it's the next step in giving you data information. Because with eye tracking, you can, you can use AI to intelligently figure out what they're looking at. And for, from a video perspective, it's great for me because I want to increase the resolution. And so what they're starting to play around with is something we, that's called foveated rendering, to where by using eye tracking, it knows where you're looking at in the screen, and it sends all the best bits to that area to give the best resolution, yeah. whereas the rest of it is reduced. So it's playing, I think, two roles. It's going to be the next step in the evolution as we start moving from toddler to a full upright child walking along uh, and giving you ammunition as a data scientist to have that, in, that input to be able to work with and how to move it back and forth. There are a few moving parts here that I find quite interesting. Like, and I want to just echo back onto this concept of how we are able to interpret visual aspects much better than, say, reading. Um, so I didn't really introduce myself. I'm, I'm Max, a co-founder of this that. It's a social polling platform. It's an app where you can ask questions to the world and find out what the world thinks. And we've simplified it massively to this or that questions and allowed users to see images of the this or that options. And we've noticed that people have actually started using this quite similar to how Twitter is being used in the sense of seeing what's going on, what are the trending topics. Mm -hmm. And we've noticed that it's actually very much more focused for Gen Zers, the, the, the younger audiences, they're going through this feed and without having to read uh, like even just like a 140 character short thing, which should be easy. They prefer to just see two images. Like, are you a fan of Boris Johnson? Yes or no? You know that something's going on with Boris Johnson. And you scroll down and you see something about tennis. You know who the two players are that are playing each other in the finals. It's much easier to grasp. It's much faster. And now, I think with the acceleration of education with that, that's an interesting aspect. So working together with, so bring, bringing people together in the sort of mathematics background with data science, I could do all these great charts and get all these great insights with people that have no background whatsoever in mathematics, but are also storytellers. Now, I, I see data scientists as, as storytellers as well, you know, sharing, sharing insights that, that are quite unique and, and difficult to grasp. Um, 
but then building this bridge of using visual aspects, like imagining a, a 3D world of graphs that are interactive, it's just so much more easier to comprehend. And I think this kind of splits now this discussion of which way does interactive go? Or does it go both ways at the same time? Are we going in the direction of, right, do we make it much easier to grasp complicated things because we can now do that visually? Or, just like earlier on when you were showing me how to play with the, with, with the toy, I call it a toy because it's so much fun, um, it was reactive, I was playing this boxing game. But now we make that interactive, it could be another storytelling game, I could be Harry Potter, and I, I could change the direction of the story by making friends with people in it. But that would require the characters in the game to be intelligent. So that's what we're bringing back to data science. Now, this is it's splitting into two directions. Is it um, insights, easier to digest, or is it storytelling that's more interactive? And I think you both will have different opinions on this. So let's start with Florian and take it from there. Yeah, I mean, definitely I see both parts as well. Um, but there's another big part that is called immersive analytics, where you can play around with big data uh, within virtual reality. And it has shown that you can, you know, work with much more data dimension within a virtual reality than on a, a two-dimensional display. And this plays especially out when it comes to traffic simulation, to um, smart city analysis, and so on. Because you get a much better feeling on how does the environment, the streets, the weather, and so on, work and act together. And from that perspective, you get a data intuition. And in the data science field, people say that data intuition is one of the most important things. You look at the data set, you're getting to understand the data, you're getting to understand which kind of variables and features are needed, and then afterwards you craft a model. And with more and more rising big data, with um, streaming data and so on, it won't get better with a two-dimensional display. So we need now to think about how can we implement big data, data analytics efficiently within uh, virtual reality. I mean, there are some startups there, like virtual analytics or something, probably you know them, uh, but I think there's much more potential to go up. Uh, another aspect is you can analyze and get a much better feeling for meta information. So just imagine you try to understand the star and solar system. You know, okay, we have stars, but every star has a ton of meta information. So you could just crawl through the solar system, understand how planet A or star A interacts or work with effects on star C and so on. How does the whole, um, yeah, so ecosystem. ecosystem actually work around here? Yeah. yeah, and same goes. So everywhere where actually you need to understand ecosystems, it becomes because of those two facts, understanding meta information and a lot of data, super, super crucial, which is like traffic simulation, solar systems, and so on, machines. Do you believe that um, communication will become easier with insights within data science through the use of virtual reality? Y yes. I mean, you derive faster insights, you can share them within your own words by feelings, emotions, right? This is the part that is different from us to a machine right now, um, is that we have actually emotions and a gut feeling that we develop. And this gut feeling is an output, output of a black box model that happens in the biggest neural networks that you know, and that's mm -hmm. the brain. So, yes, of course, if you're a data scientist, if you are maybe a non-data scientist, you can get faster a big picture about what is going on, and then it makes it easier also to communicate it to other stakeholders. I, I, I totally agree with you on it. I, I think what I see it developing is on, on two fronts. I think there is the, what I tend to think of as, as more the, the pure data and the information being transferred back and forth. But then the other side of me, the, the storyteller, the visual artist, I see it as a tool. I see using the data to create something that connects with my audience better. Mm -hmm. That I can go ahead and, for instance, the idea of doing something like Black Mirror, where you had a choice 
of doing narrative storytelling, yeah. and you can decide which way to go. Now, that was a very isolated and very uh, limited way of interacting. But I think with data, data analytics and with data science, I think we can expand that and make it more interactive and also more immediate. Because the faster we can crunch those numbers, the faster that we can give the audience a decision to make. Which way do you want to go? Do you want to go through this door or do you want to go through this door? And, so, and in that subsection, I think you also have two things. I think you have storytelling for entertainment and I think you have educational yeah, aspects. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I guess I said it all also in, a, in another side sentence, but it is crucial to generate exactly that added value because otherwise you're not going to use a magic leap data gathering system that maybe looks right now not super beautiful and so on. You know, you only use it if it has a massive data, um, added value. And that is right now the challenge, not just your challenge in your field, it's also the challenge of data science right now, adding value and adding a measurable ROI actually. Finding a way to marry the two together. I liked how you brought it to education with storytelling. Um, I remember doing uh, an IQ test as, as a young boy, and one of the, the challenges was they put like a hundred different items on the table, and they asked me to remember these items. And I, I did miserable, I didn't do very well. And I was really upset, and so I asked the doctor, how can I do this better, how can I do this better? And he told me a little trick, and he said, tell yourself a story. See the little items, give the item a name, this is a friend with this person, this something with this person, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I did the same test again a few months later, and I was able to remember every single item. Storytelling is very powerful in education. But then also storytelling with immersive games inside virtual reality is amazing, and this is where I'm going to tie it back to data science. So if you think of uh, an immersive, interactive game through virtual reality, it's almost impossible to pan out all the infinite amount of stories you can go. I could stand up right now, I could walk that way, I could walk this way, I can interact with this person, that person. A much more easier and also interesting way of going about it is actually using AI to give characters their own feelings, give them their own way of engaging with the world. That way they can react in a normal human way. It can be quite fun, you can make friends in this world almost, um, and it'd be much more lifelike, and it'd also actually be easier to build. But this is where it's a completely new field. They, um, in Edinburgh, I met a startup that are using natural language processing to actually do storytelling. And they would use this to give the, the characters feelings. So if you were responding with them in an angry way, they would get upset. Or if you responded to them in an upbeat way, they would be intrigued and would want to talk to you more. I think this is a really interesting thing that could make this interactive space in virtual reality much better, not just in gaming, but in education as well. What do you guys think? Absolutely. I think that that's a big part of moving it all forward. And I think it's all, you know, we're taking incremental steps and we were talking a little bit about what's going to be the big thing to jump us ahead. Mm. I'm not so sure that there is going to be one big thing. Mm. I think it's going to be a combination of things that come together. And then I think it's just, I mean, when, you know, when VR first came out, the gamers jumped on it. And that's really where they attacked. Now they're starting to uh, go more into the video realm. Uh, for instance, yesterday, Amazon just announced that they're creating a VR platform on Oculus where they're going to have content. I think all of this, even though they seem to be not related to data science, I think, in fact, they're very they're essential to it. Because what it's doing is it's moving us forward, looking for that next step. Because every time, I mean, I remember my first mobile phone. It was in a bag and it had a very heavy battery and it had a cord attached to the handset. All right, and then I thought it was great because I got this this Motorola brick with this big rubber duck antenna sticking out the top, and I had it on my hip like a giant you know tortoise shell on the side of me. Now you know we have this small little things that we carry around with us, and as you were saying before, you know next thing is going to be eventually it's going to be a chip in your brain. Uh, it's all moving along and. We're going to look back on it and say, wow, that was a great advancement. But as we're living it right now, it doesn't seem like a fast advancement. It seems like it's going at a snail's pace. I really liked your analogy with it being a human, the sort of metaphor of it growing from a baby, biblical cord, 
growing into a toddler. Just wait for the teenage years, it'll be terrible. Yeah. Rebellion, what's going to happen there? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. This is this is where it could you know splitter into all different directions. Not just education, not just games, but who knows? Um, replacing business rooms, you know, offices. Do we need these spaces? Could we not replace those with living accommodation and use up less space in the world and actually interact in a social way from anywhere? Well, I, you know, I, I actually am a very good example of that. I've been living in Thailand for eighteen years. So I was a digital nomad before the word existed. Mm. And I communicate on a daily basis with viewers all over the world, interviewing people in Bangkok, interviewing people in China, wherever I am, wherever I travel to, and I'm communicating with them from wherever I am. Mm. So that's a huge step forward from you know the years before. So I mean, again, everything moves forward and, and we're constantly evolving and just like a child growing up, you know, we look at it and it seems very slow to the child, but yet when we look back at it, we're going to say, wow, that went by really fast. I'm going to bring this back to you, Florian. And um, the thing that I'm interested in is now, so I was explaining how data science is actually already used to optimize what should be focused in an image. It's using eye tracking to say, right, this person's going to look over there, let's optimize the views over there, and this can be blurring the other aspects. So that's already optimization in the sense of utilizing less required data to make the experience easier and more lightweight. But now data science can massively evolve to the next huge step of interactive people in this environment as well. But there'll be so many different steps in between. Is there something that you see happening in between? or something that you think is pivotal before going to that point of being interacted? Uh, yeah, I mean, within the data science field, we have the big problem that most of the systems are not getting on a deployment stage. So mm -hmm. we have a lot of data science projects out there. Everybody's talking about AI, ML, you know. And there are just a few use cases that are really successful right now. It's like fault detection from your Visa card or something like that. Besides that, the next big, hopefully, uh, door opener is autonomous driving. Because mm -hmm. there we have the first time a real acting, you know, AI system. It's driving your car, it is recognizing the environment, and taking all those insights and data into consideration, feeding it back to do better and more clever decisions. And this kind of workflow is exactly the workflow that we also need to make an efficient virtual reality system. So even so, maybe on the first view, both of those fields, autonomous driving and virtual reality, are not super much connected. Mm -hmm. They are actually, because autonomous driving shows us how we should build a system that helps the virtual reality. I, I was at CES Asia in Shanghai this year, and one of the most interesting things that I saw, besides as far as autonomous driving, they had an 18-wheel truck that was fully autonomous, and it was the 18 the, wheels. Eight, you know, an 18. Basically, you know, you put a big the, the tractor trailer. Uh -huh. And so you would get in and you could actually climb out and they had the separate seat with a massager and they had a tea making service and all of this so that the, the driver isn't really driving anymore if the truck is doing it all. You can actually get out of the seat and move. I don't think I'd want to see that on the road right now, but that's kind of right. That's where we're going. And yeah, but, but you don't want to see it on the roads right now. I'd be a little scared of it right yeah, now, especially exactly. in Bangkok. <laughs> but I mean, exactly <laughs> that scary fear. If, uh, feeling, right, probably leads also to the fact that not everybody has right now a virtual reality system at home, right? But in five years, I would probably not even blink at seeing it on the road. It's, that's what I, yeah, I agree, totally, and that's where we're at. I mean, where I wanted to, to head over is actually the adoption, you know? So everybody, the customer himself, governments, industries, and so on, need to change and need to adapt a massive and fast um, technology-driven evolution, yep. you know, as you just explained, so your first mobile phone was definitely not a smartphone, um, now we have smartphones, virtual reality, autonomous driving cars, etc, 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 so, and it's escalating more and more and more, yep. so, 
we need to be aware that um, if not the customer, you know, understands what's, hap what's happening there and what, what kind of technology it is actually. Uh, we go into the problem that just a few tech guys will conquer that world, you know, with virtual reality and autonomous driving. And on the other side, it will also lead to adoption problems. I mean, virtual reality is out there. I mean, probably you will correct me, but when I went in the, during the 90s to the US, I remember my father using a kind of a virtual reality in a, you know, in such a play, play hall. Mm -hmm. So, and now it's like 30 years later and virtual reality is still not reality. No, and it's done. And, and, but what we're seeing now is we're seeing devices that are easier for people to get their hands on. And for instance, what Max just experienced when we were downstairs uh, in the speaker room getting ready, and he put on the Oculus Quest, and he had what I call the aha moment. When he put on the headset, and all of a sudden he went, oh my god, this is amazing! This is wild! Oh my god! That's and true. It's, it's the aha <laughs> they did. We had to actually, actually Florian was like about to tackle him and grab the headset off of him because we needed to get ready for this panel. But it was, and it's what I see all the time, and I love seeing it. I, you know, I've gotten to see, we've got the Oculus Rift downstairs, and we're doing something simple playing Beat Saber. And there's a few people in the audience here who really had a great time playing it, and they all of a sudden now are saying, wow, this is really cool. I can see where this can fit into my life as exercise, as entertainment. And then from there, we go on to how does it really apply to education, to helping your thought process, to integrating into society? So they say for you to, to bring it into a new product successfully, it's got to be 10x. And whilst that experience was absolutely amazing, it was so cool, I would say it's on the border. It's like 8, 9, 9x. The, so what was amazing, I, I put this, these goggles on and what I hadn't experienced before what was the next level here was I could put a little radius around me and choose the space that I wanted to be in and I knew it was completely safe. So they put all these different obstacles I could play with in this space and I knew that no matter what I did, I, I was safe. And if I, whenever I stepped out of this environment, I would in 3D be able to see everything around me. So that was, it has cameras built in so you're actually seeing the real world. So from the last experience I had, I didn't feel safe. I, I fell off my bed when I was trying to fly across some island. Um, and this time I felt really safe, so that's definitely an improvement. Um, and I think the thing that will make it 10x is, is this interactive. Because that, that's when it will splitter into so many different realms. It will be involved in storytelling for education. Um, it will be in, involved with gaming, but in a much more interactive, fun way. Gaming will be changed completely. Um, it will, I mean, it, we could have virtual office rooms and that's, that's sort of penetrating the market in a completely different way. Um, now, there are efforts to, to show people this product and try and get it out there. Like you have these sort of experience centers where you can see things and that's great. But I, I, I do think it's going to require that next step to, to, to get everyone on. I just want to bring it back to you, Florian, because you were talking about the infrastructure behind autonomous vehicles. And I think the difficulties with deployment. Where do you, could you sort of just describe that a little bit more to, to the people here, the infrastructure that's required to, say, change this virtual reality to an interactive platform, and how difficult you think that is, and how long you think that would take? Huh. Okay. That sounds like a really tricky question. Okay. Uh, give, me a, give me a try. Uh, I mean, on a technical, on a technical perspective, I actually don't see a big problem. Mm, so on a really technical perspective, since I mean, actually, a virtual reality is the newest one, the, the Quest, right? Oculus Quest um, has already you is actually using autonomous driving technology, right, with a leader sensor and so on. Yeah. So they already get all those environmental data and so on into the system. Um, from a technical perspective, I mean, the risk is lesser than having an autonomous driving car because yeah. you are in a virtual reality. You hope. So technical-wise, I guess it is already now possible. Okay. The, the problem that we really face is, is more to rethink also, look, 
When you work in a digital office, what do you have in your mind? Describe to me when you say digital office. Do I mean, you mean like yeah. the I office mean, I have in Berlin with my computers and my colleagues next to me. Exactly. So, so I mean, in your picture of a digital office and virtual yeah. reality, right. it's probably just a 3D built office, maybe with a several more displays, you yeah. know? Yeah. And that it is. My, but my, you know, the usability in virtual reality might be a totally different one. And my, it, my view or sort of hope of it is perhaps full high expectation, but it's, it's the flexibility of having that office experience that you have, like in the real world. You have your colleagues there next to you, you can speak to them, they're in the same room as yourself. But then also that ability to interact with data in the same time, so you can, when you're working, tell stories, interact in a much more effective way. So that's how I see it to offer us. Yeah, but you know, we built like those desktop systems and so on because we were technically limited. Yeah. We are nowadays not limited with virtual reality to build uh, something that is closest to the reality where we learn, laugh, have emotions, all that kind of stuff. That brings us to the topic that we might need a new Steve Jobs who is developing, yeah. you know, something like a desktop, something like an a iPhone mouse, or an iPhone or something that is doing the revolution, you know? Because what makes it sexy? What makes it want people in their hands? Not just sexy, what is the usability of virtual reality really? Because it shouldn't be like a black room with six different displays instead of having two displays and you are mm -hmm. actually really uh, your, your actually reality, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, this is, this is a big problem, it's a usability thing. Technical wise, definitely, it, because I, I didn't answer the, the question, I guess, clearly, I don't see a problem. That's good, that's good. So then, within your experience within the space, and you see the research, everything that's being done, what kind of evolutions do you see that might be tackling exactly what Florian is saying? I'm working on, I work with a lot of beta and even alpha testing of new products and, yeah. and, and one of the things that I'm working on, I can't go into too much detail about it, but re imagine replacing your Skype conference call or whatever, whatever service you use, but instead uh, you're putting on a, on a headset, but you don't have to worry that Joe Black over in New York doesn't have a headset, he's just got a regular uh, you know, uh, uh, a computer cam, mm -hmm. and he's doing it in two in in two D, and See. integrating all of those together so that no matter who you're communicating with, whatever video device that they have to communicate with, it's able to be integrated together. And this is something that that's hasn't happened yet. Because that's ease of penetration, I suppose, ease of adapting to this new mm -hmm. technology. And as well, it's also encouraging people who have just a regular PC camera to then step into the exactly. uh, to the VR yeah. market and get a headset and say, well, this is really cool, I'm going to do this now instead. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, it's, again, it's a matter of adoption, and adoption comes slowly, and a lot of it has to do with the economics of the situation. There are areas where the headsets are easily available, and there are other areas where they're not. So that also plays into the, the whole factor of adoption and that crossover point, that, yeah. that tipping point. It could be actually that the that you're probably right. The technology is already there, and it's it's it is uh, the need for Steve Jobs, someone to understand how do we market this, how do we get this into people's hands, yep. and that to me seems like an obvious one. If I were to have my next Skype call with an investor, but he was actually sitting in a virtual reality room, I think, well, this guy's cool. I want to meet this person, um, and then now I'd be thinking, oh, I want to try this technology out myself as well. I want to get on board in this. I mean, there are already uh, VR chat rooms, and with the Oculus system, you can go into a VR chat where you have avatars, but I want to see it go to that next step. Instead of avatars, I want to see a hologram of you as I'm talking to you, and, and you're in Germany, and uh, you're in, in Switzerland, and I'm in Bangkok. You know, I, wanna, I want to have that physical presence that's more easily identifiable. I don't want to talk to a cartoon. I want to talk to a person. And I think when we reach that point, and I don't think it's that far away, I think when we reach that point, I think then you're going to see much, adoption is going to move along uh, as, the, as the technology progresses. This gets me to question, actually, 
do you go forward and try and make the technology that bit more amazing that people will just jump that big hurdle and that big learning curve or put the money out? Or do you take a step back and think, how do we make this more accessible? Because the, the concept of me just using my phone and using Skype on my phone, but seeing that that person's in a 3D environment makes me, you know, it increases the reach and gets me used to it and seeing it and then would make me more likely to want to try it out. Whereas this sort of hologram of someone else, that's something I would have to see on TV, on the news, telling me this is possible, but I'd have to go out there and get it myself. Yep. I was just, I was just at, uh, I also got to attend the at t Shape event in uh, LA at, at Warner Brothers Studios. And at t it was all built around 5G. And what they did was they had volumetric capture systems set up. And I was able to get into the volumetric capture. I was, they did a, a volumetric of me, and then they projected it within a matter of moments onto my hand as a mini me. There right. is the hologram right there, okay. volumetric capture, and you don't have the wig wiggling, see-through thing. You've got something that looks like you're standing right next to them. You know, so you have elements of AR and VR combined together, yeah. and it's available now. It's just a matter of the cost of a volumetric video capture is quite expensive. Mm -hmm. But like everything else, the first one always costs a lot to the early adopters, and then the prices start to come down. So where where's the economic model might be a better question. Where does it be? Where can a Steve Jobs? I mean, Steve Jobs didn't make it the Mac because he 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 thought it would be glorious. He thought it because he thought he could make money, and that always is the bottom line with any advancement in technology. Where is the money? It's actually funny that you say that because he would always say that for him he wants to help education. He wants to make it easier to learn. And we're kind of drawing this back to virtual reality now as well. That, that could be a story that's easier to learn with that. Well, definitely there's that, that part of it. I mean, and again, that's where data science comes in. Because any to help educate when you don't have the personal connection. I mean, teachers are data scientists. They look at their students. They listen to their students. They glean how their students are doing. And they give them feedback in the form, of, you know, we did it in the form of grades. Now... We are taking that to an automated system to where data scientists will take the information that's coming in, transform it into something that's helpful and can help someone learn. So it's just another way of doing it. Bringing it back to the, the topic of the panel, digital transformation through data science and virtual reality. Um, we put this very much in a focus on virtual reality. Uh, and how that will be aided through data science. Do you think there is anything on the flip side? Could data science be aided through virtual reality? Could that added new form of data possibly create new desires to use that data in different ways? Very tricky question. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it is good question too. And I mean. I had the feeling we talked already about that, right? Like eye tracking data or something. Yeah. That is a data source that we know, or at least I know, like from my studies, really, you know, old market research stuff where you get glasses on and then, then you check where a person actually looks on, you know, and how do they, yeah, like attractiveness studies, you know, where does a person look first, second, and so on. So we had this kind of research field, but we had never enough data. Yeah. And now we produce this kind of data source with all those um, yeah, visual tools like augmented reality and so on. I, just a quick interjection on that, and that is that you know, data science and VR being connected, I think they, they really work very much hand in hand. Because the more VR units that you get out into the into the consumer market, the more you're going to more data science you're going to get back, the more information you're going to get back. That's right. The more eye tracking information, the more information that comes back through that interaction. It's a it's a Victoria cycle helping itself. I'm just going to point out that the time is up, so I'll open the floor to to any questions. Um, please raise your hand. Let us know if there's anything you'd like to ask. Anyone? Now is your chance. Going once. Going twice. 
Oh, the man know. in the gray shirt in the back. No, <laughs> <laughs> no questions? Any of us among us still have some more remaining questions? I mean, how do we sum that now up? That we generate like a very condensed added value for the audience. Like, I, I think the key, the key word is evolution, not revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think revolution implies almost a forced concept moving forward. Yeah. Whereas evolution is more of a natural state evolving. Uh, you know, whatever other words you want to put to that. And I think what we're going to see, I think, is a natural evolution moving forward. Somewhere somebody has said, this is the direction we're going in. Uh, it's already been established that there's enough VR headsets sold that we've gone past the tipping point now, that this, isn't, this is no longer a fad. It's here to stay. And the more you see companies getting involved in promoting it and moving forward with it, like an Amazon with its un almost unlimited resources, I think that's going to drive things moving forward. And they're going to always look for some other way to integrate it. To, to summarize, I would bring it back to the story of VR was in a space of crawling, trying out new technologies. And as it's moved into the toddler space, it's moving from crawling to standing up a little bit, moving around, it's trying out, it's building out these, these holograms, these, it's integrating autonomous vehicle technology, it's, um, we're, we're experimenting with natural language processing to be able to make VR interactive, that you can make conversations and friends on this platform with people that don't actually exist. But we're still trying to figure out what it is. We're trying to figure out what is the economic use case. And we're going to get there. I, I have one question for the audience. Show of hands, how many people in the audience have used a VR headset, have experienced it? That, I think that kind of tells the tale. I mean, we've got maybe, what, a half a dozen? Yeah. And I think therein lies the rub, so to speak. Uh, we need to get more people to have that aha moment and yeah. see what's going on and understand it. Uh, and then the context for asking questions and being uh, a little bit more involved in a conversation about it, I think it, 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 it again, it evolves. Absolutely. Any final comments for him? Nope. Right. I mean, I, I'm super satisfied. That was super nice. That was a great conversation. And we are already like five, six, seven minutes of our time, so at least we enjoyed it. Thank I you. hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you very much for coming. That's it for me. Thank you very much for my thank you. So I would like you to please stand up and still remain on the stage here. We have a token of appreciation to give to all three of you. Please remain on the stage for a minute. แล้วก็ขอเรียนเชิญคุณพีรสานบรณะสันติค่ะทั้งบริหารจากไทยไลฟ์ทีมนะคะมอบของเครือลึกให้กับสปีกเกอร์ของเราทั้งสามท่านค่ะเช่นค่ะผ่านคนเวลาแล้วค่ะเมื่อครู่นี้เรื่องของ drive digital transformation by data scientists and VR นะคะก็เป็นมุมมองจากทั้งสามท่านนะคะที่ต่างๆกันออกไปเนี่ยเราก็ได้ความรู้ความเพียบเลยโอเค let's have a group photo together everyone look straight in front เดี๋ยวหลังจากนี้นะคะน่าจะเป็นอ,อ,อีกหนึ่งหัวข้อที่ทุกท่านก็ตั้งตารอคอยเช่นเดียวกันนะคะโอเคเรียบร้อยค่ะเอาเสียงขอบคุณอีกครั้งหนึ่งค่ะวันนี้เป็นพิเศษนะคุณออฟเฟอร์เบอร์เดสขอบคุณอีกครั้งนะคะ